prosecutor who would take his place as acting U.S. attorney did he relent and step aside. So what are we to make of these events? If this had been an isolated incident, if the Attorney General had simply misjudged the situation and thought that Mr. Berman would go quietly, then we might chalk up this episode to simple miscommunication and incompetence. But make no mistake, this was not an isolated incident. The effort to remove Mr. Berman is of a clear and dangerous pattern of conduct that began when Mr. Barr took office and continues to this day. Mr. Barr's actions make clear that in his Department of Justice, the President's allies get special treatment. The President's enemies, real and imagined, are targeted for extra scrutiny, and the needs of the American people and the needs of justice are generally ignored. Mr. Barr's practice of using the Department to shield the President and his allies goes back to the beginning of his tenure at the DOJ. Last year, when the special counsel had completed his investigation, when Mr. Barr had the report in hand, but before the public could read it, the Attorney General blatantly mischaracterized the special counsel's findings, and he did so on the President's behalf. Among other deceptions, Mr. Barr pretended that compelling evidence of obstruction of justice, including evidence that the President may have lied directly to the special counsel, simply did not exist. Mr. Barr's deception seems blatant, but don't take my word for it. The special counsel wrote to Mr. Barr directly to complain about the inaccuracies, which lingered uncorrected for weeks. A federal judge later said that Mr. Barr's inconsistencies were so distorted and misleading that he questioned Mr. Barr's credibility and, in turn, could not trust the department's assurances to the court about the contents of the Mueller report. Mr. Barr has also worked to undermine the criminal cases stemming from the special counsel's report. Early this year, after the President's associate, Roger Stone, was convicted of obstructing justice, Mr. Barr overruled his career prosecutors and recommended a lighter sentence for President Trump's friend. One of those prosecutors, Mr. Zelensky, will testify today about that experience. We should be clear about the timeline in the Stone case. If nothing else, it helps explain why Mr. Berman refused to go quietly over the weekend. In January, Mr. Barr removed the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia and replaced her with his longtime aide. In February, President Trump tweeted his feelings about Stone's ongoing criminal case. The President was outraged that Mr. Stone, his friend, might be punished for obstructing justice. Quickly thereafter, Mr. Barr reached into the case, overruled his prosecutors, and submitted a wildly lenient sentencing recommendation for Mr. Stone. All four prosecutors involved in the case, including Mr. Zelensky, immediately withdrew. The next day, President Trump tweeted his congratulations to Mr. Barr. The Stone case wasn't an isolated incident either. In May, Mr. Barr abruptly reversed course on the prosecution of Michael Flynn, the President's former national security advisor, who pled guilty to lying to the FBI about his conversations with the Russian ambassador. Once again, the President tweeted his feelings about the case. Once again, Mr. Barr reached into the proceedings, overruled his career prosecutors, misrepresented statements by department officials, and asked the court to dismiss the charges against Mr. Flynn. And once again, the President tweeted his delight at the outcome. Former federal judge John Gleason appointed by the court to account for Mr. Barr's unprecedented motion to dismiss the case against Mr. Flynn, argued that, quote, the facts surrounding the filing of the government's motion constitute clear evidence of gross prosecutorial abuse. They reveal an unconvincing effort to disguise as legitimate a decision to dismiss that is based solely on the fact that Flynn is a political ally of President Trump. Judge Gleason was not alone. Days after Mr. Barr insisted on dropping charges against Mr. Flynn, almost 2,000 former FBI agents and Department of Justice officials wrote an open letter calling for the Attorney General's resignation. Now, my Republican colleagues may try to explain these events, these incidents, away. They may tell you that Barr's attempts to fire Berman were harmless, that Flynn and Stone should be excused for their crimes, 
and then Mr. Barr's extraordinary attempts to protect the president from criminal liability are necessary to correct for a vast conspiracy at the Justice Department. Those excuses ring hollow. There is injustice at the Justice Department, ladies and gentlemen, as there is extensive injustice in our justice system nationwide. We have rightly focused on one major aspect of that injustice in recent weeks, since the murder of George Floyd at the hands of law enforcement officers. But as we prepare to address that injustice on the House floor, in the single largest and most sweeping package of police reforms in our country's history, I cannot help but notice that the members who tend to shout loudest about hoaxes and witch hunts also stand in opposition to these common sense reforms. Ask yourselves, what are you saying to the American people when your commitment to justice means that you will stand up for Flynn and Stone and Barr, but go no further? No, Mr. Barr's work at the Department of Justice has nothing to do with correcting injustice. He is the president's fixer. He has shown us that there is one set of rules for the president's friends and another set of rules for the rest of us. And to be clear, there are plenty of reasons to be angry with Attorney General Barr. It is unacceptable that he would order the Antitrust Division to initiate pretextual investigations into industries that he and the president do not like simply because they do not like them. Mr. Elias will testify to that abuse today. It is dangerous and misguided for him to threaten frivolous litigation against state and local officials doing their best to contain the COVID-19 epidemic in their communities. It is simply irresponsible for him to do so in the total absence of guidance from the White House or leadership from the President. And it is outrageous that Mr. Barr occupied this city with a federal police force outfitted in paramilitary gear, and then turned that force on peaceful protesters in Lafayette Square, spraying them with tear gas and physically knocking them back, all to arrange for an awkward photo op for President Trump. The images from that day are so disturbing that we cannot blame Mr. Barr for trying to avoid responsibility for his role in the event in the days since. But please understand that these are merely the symptoms of an underlying disease. The sickness that we must address is, is Mr. Barr's use of the Department of Justice as a weapon to serve the President's petty private interests. The cancer that we must root out is his decision to place the President's interests above the interests of the American people. Our witnesses today will speak to the extremes to which Mr. Barr has reached to carry out the President's bidding. I am especially grateful to Mr. Elias and Mr. Zelensky, who are current Department employees for their bravery in appearing before the committee. This administration has a record of witness intimidation, and I have no doubt that they will try to exact a price for your testimony. But you are patriots, and you have done your duty here today. It gives me hope for what may come at the Department of Justice when Bill Barr is finally removed. I thank the witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to your testimony. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Bar Justice Department is about correcting injustice. I mean, the very day, you almost have to laugh at this, the very day you have a hearing going after the Bar Justice Department and alleging that there's politics involved there, the very day we get the order from the United States Court of Appeals. The order says, Dismissing the Flynn case, the district court is directed to grant the government's motion to dismiss. The district court's order appointing amicus is hereby vacated. The very, I mean, they're not political. They're just right. If there's any politics. I mean, it's, again, you almost have to laugh if it wasn't so serious. The politics, the, Attorney General Holder said he was Obama's wingman. The Obama-Biden Justice Department attacked investigative journalists. Here's what one of them said. Here's what one of them said. James Risen with the New York Times said this. If a president throws a whistleblower in jail for trying to talk to a reporter or gets the FBI to spy on a journalist, he will have one man to thank for bequeathing him such expansive power, Barack Obama. That's not me talking, that's James Risen of the New York Times when the Justice Department, the Obama holder Biden Justice Department went after him. Of course, we know about Fast and Furious, we know about Operation Choke Point, and even though the chairman always 
doesn't want to talk about this. We know how political the Justice Department was in the whole Russian hoax, the whole Trump-Russia investigation. Remember this, the Obama-Biden Department of Justice spied on four American citizens. That's, that's the big thing you guys have with, with Bill Barr, too. The first time he testified in front of the Senate, he used the word spying and everyone went crazy. But he used the word spying because that's exactly what happened. They spied on four American citizens associated with the presidential campaign, an investigation we now know was completely bogus because Rick Grinnell released all the transcripts from all the people who were involved in the intelligence community in the previous administrations, and they all said there was nothing there. The Obama-Biden Justice Department, in order to spy on those Americans, what did they do? They lied to the FISA court 17 times. They used the now famous dossier, the dossier that Jim Comey, not Jim Jordan, Jim Comey said was salacious and unverified. They didn't tell the court the guy who wrote it was, quote, desperate to stop Trump. They didn't tell the guy who wrote it was being paid by the Clinton campaign to put it together. And they used that to get a warrant to spy on one of our fellow citizens. And you guys think that's no big deal. Bill Barr understands that's a big deal. And that's why John Durham is doing his investigation. And of course, you know who else thought it was a big deal? The Inspector General of the Justice Department, Michael Horowitz, who wrote a 400-page report talking about those 17 lies, talking about all the abuses that took place in the Comey, Biden, Obama Justice Department. But guess what? This committee, the Judiciary Committee, didn't even get a chance to ask questions of Mr. Horowitz about that report because the chairman won't bring him in to testify. I don't know if I've ever seen anything like that. 400-page report written by the Inspector General of the Justice Department, scathing report about the FISA court and the chair of the Judiciary Committee with the storied history this committee has in protecting people's liberties, won't even let him come in and testify. Well, here's what U.S. District Judge and FISA presiding judge Rosemary Collier said about the findings in Mr. Horowitz's report, quote, the frequency with which representations made by FBI personnel turned out to be unsupported, think about that, representations made by FBI personnel turned out to be unsupported. You know what that is? That's a nice way of saying they lied or contradicted by information in their possession and with which they withheld information detrimental to their case. Withheld information detrimental to their case is another way of saying they lied, calls into question whether information contained in other FBI applications is reliable. You put that all in simple English, what Judge Collier was saying is, you guys lied to us so many darn times, how are we supposed to believe anything you bring in front of the court? That was all in that 400-page report from the Inspector General, but Chairman Nadler won't even let Inspector General Horowitz come in here and answer our questions and go into, into detail about that report. And yet today, the day we get the ruling from the Court of Appeals, the Chairman says it's the Trump DOJ, it's the Barr DOJ that's political. Guess what else happened in the final days of the Obama administration? Guess what else happened? 38 different people unmasked Michael Flynn's name 49 times. 49 times. Clapper, Comey, Brennan, Biden unmasked Michael Flynn. Six people at the Treasury Department. Holy cow. Everyone, this is between Election Day and Inauguration Day. And Bill Barr just simply wants to get to the bottom of all this and somehow that's political, when in fact the politics was in the previous administration, he's trying to stop it so it doesn't. Here's what these people said. Here's how we know this was all a joke. Clapper, I never saw any direct evidence that the Trump campaign or someone was conspiring with the Russians. Jim Clapper said that, and yet we had a two-year investigation by the Mueller team. Susan Rice, I don't recall intelligence that I would consider evidence. Ben Rhodes said the same. Sally Yates, I don't believe anybody had reached a conclusion yet as to whether Russians were conspiring with. They had nothing, yet they go through this entire investigation. Samantha Power, same thing. All these key people who were unmasking Michael Flynn's name all knew there was no predicate for the investigation, and it happened, and somehow the Barr Justice Department is political? Like I said, they're not political. They're just right, and we saw that with the decision today. Finally, let me just say this. I have never seen anything like I've been saying this for I don't know how long, but it's the truth. I have never seen an agency where this happened. The top people, the very people Bill Barr, in that same, that same testimony he gave where he, talked about, where he talked about spying, he also said this. He said, there was a failure of leadership at the upper echelon of the FBI in the previous administration. That may be the understatement of the year. Jim Comey fired, leaked memos, leaked memos in order to get the special counsel to put our country through what, what we went through the past few years. 
Andy McCabe, deputy director, fired, referred by that same IG for prosecution. Jim Baker, FBI counsel, investigated by the U.S. attorney in Connecticut, took information from the DNC lawyer. And of course, now famous Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, the individuals who ran the Clinton investigation, the mid-year exam, ran Crossfire Hurricane, Crossfire Razor, the Trump-Russia investigations. They were both kicked off of Mueller's team. Peter Strzok was fired. We all know the bias they had against President Trump. We saw it in hundreds of text messages that we've all, are all now too familiar with. The politics was in the previous administration. Bill Barr is doing the Lord's work trying to clean it up so that it doesn't happen again. And we have said this before, and I'll say it in, in closing. Emmett Flood's statement a little over a year ago, where he said this, we would all do well to remember if they can do it to a president. They can lie to a FISA court to get a warrant to go after a president, to go after a major party's political campaign. If they can do it to a president, imagine what they can do to you or I. Imagine what they can do to the folks we get the privilege of representing back home. That's why this is important. That's why the work Bill Barr is doing is important. You guys can continue to play your political games. Bill Barr is going to get to the truth. I yield back. Mr. Chairman, I have parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. The, uh, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. Without objection, um, three letters from Bradley Weinsheimer, the Associate Deputy Attorney General, will be admitted into the record. I will now introduce today's Mr. Chairman, witnesses. parliamentary inquiry. Order. Gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. What provision of the Democrats' new House rules allows for a duly subpoenaed witness to appear and provide testimony by video? The rules so provide. I will now introduce today's... Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the, the, the copy of the subpoena that we have that was issued to Mr. The Aaron Zelensky the gentleman, does not the allow for that. Rule, the gentleman not, has not stated... The, the chair has not answered the inquiry. Section 4F1 allows the ruling. committees to issue subpoenas. Feel the ruling of the chair. We're not, the witnesses are not allowed Mr. to attend by video under the subpoena that the chairman issued. Section 4F1 of the rules of the House allows, House resolution, 965. Of House resolution 965 allows committees to issue subpoenas for return by a remote participation. The subpoena reads, you are hereby commanded to be and appear before the committee. The commit gentleman will suspend. I will now introduce today's witnesses. Appeal the ruling of the chair, Mr. Chairman. I will now introduce today. Mr. Chairman. Witnesses. Donald Iyer Mr. served Chairman, as yeah. Deputy Attorney General under President George H.W. Bush. He joined the department Mr. as an Chairman, assistant you U.S. cannot attorney. simply go he over a point order, but to this point, repeal the ruling of the chair. And I'm speaking to you to gavel me down, but this is Rules don't matter months. in here, apparently. 18 months, he's appealed the ruling of a chair. At least honor the parliamentary procedure. It is. There was a ruling. He, he was not... Point of order. I challenge the subpoena being issued that he can appear uh, remotely. I make a point of order. The chair is not a recognizable point of order. I challenge the ruling of the chair. You cannot appeal or not. Just deny my point of order. I challenge the ruling of the chair. Donald Iyer served as Deputy Attorney General. Of Here we go again. I appealed the ruling of the chair on a point of order. You cannot overlook that. And Mr. Collins, you can't no interrupt these proceedings, and the American people deserve to know the truth. There was no the ruling. This has matter. nothing to do with the truth. This has to do with the ruling there of the committee. There was no ruling of the chair. I made a point of order. You the, ruled. The, That's the, a ruling. The point of order was not cognizable. Then I appeal the ruling of the chair on not recognizing the not point of order. ruling of the chair to appeal. Donald Iyer served as Deputy Mr. Attorney Chairman, General. Chairman, can I do Nothing the changes around here. This is no ironic. Donald Iyer served as raise. Deputy Attorney General under President George H.W. Bush. He joined the department as an assistant U.S. attorney and held a number of other positions, including United States attorney in the Eastern District of California and principal deputy solicitor general under President Reagan. Previously, Mr. Iyer clerked for Justice William Rehnquist and Judge Malcolm Wilkie of the D.C. Circuit. After his career in public service, he was in private practice and has also taught extensively at law schools around the country. Mr. Iyer received his B.A. from Stanford University and his M.A. and J.D. from Harvard University. Aaron Zielinski is an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Maryland. Previously, Mr. Zielinski served as a special assistant United States attorney in the District of Columbia, as an assistant special counsel in special counsel Robert Mueller's office, and a special assistant to the legal advisor in the State Department. 
Previously, Mrs. Zielinski clerked for Justice Kennedy before his retirement from the Supreme Court and for Justice John Paul Stevens after his retirement, as well as for Judge Thomas Griffith on the D.C. Circuit. Mr. Zielinski received his J.D. and B.A. from Yale University. I note for the record that pursuant to Section 4C6 of House Resolution 965, Mrs. Zielinski's personal counsel is participating in this hearing on the WebEx software platform. John Elias is a trial attorney in the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. Since joining the department in 2006, he has served in a variety of roles, including Acting Chief of Staff of the Antitrust Division. In 2015, following a detail to the White House's Presidential Personnel Office, he joined the Office of the Associate Attorney General, where he served for various periods as Counsel, Chief of Staff, and Deputy Associate Attorney General. Mr. Elias received his JD from Stanford Law School and his BA from Yale University. The Honorable Michael Mukasey served as United States Attorney, as the United States Attorney General from November 2007 to November to January 2009 under President George W. Bush. Prior to his service as Attorney General, he served as a judge in the Southern District of New York, becoming Chief Judge in 2000. Previously, he served as an assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York. He is currently in private practice. Judge Mukasey received his law degree from Yale University and his BA from Columbia College. We welcome all of our distinguished witnesses and we thank them for their participation. Now, if you would please rise, I'll begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you and please be seated. And let me extend a special wel welcome to Judge Mukasey, uh, whom I well remember from our- Mr. Dinner, Chairman, could we get a vocal dinner? from Mr. Zelensky? All we could see was his hand up. Well remember from our dinner is that- I guess uh, not. Dramas. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, for those witnesses testifying in person, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. For Mr. Zielinski, there is a timer on your screen to help you keep track of time. Mr. Ayer, you may begin. Yeah, your, your mic, your mic. mic. Good afternoon, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee. Thank you very much for inviting me to appear today. I was privileged to serve in the Department of Justice under two Republican and one Democratic president, and I am here because I believe that William Barr poses the greatest threat in my lifetime to our rule of law and to public trust in it. That is because he does not believe in its core principle, that no person is above the law. Instead, since taking office, he has worked to advance his lifelong conviction that the president should hold virtually autocratic powers. That includes immunity from nearly all checks and balances and being able to accord special treatment to himself and his friends. The system that Barr is working to tear down was put in place in the aftermath of the Watergate scandals, which involved extensive government corruption and caused a widespread loss of trust. After Nixon resigned, President Ford's Attorney General Edward Levy acted swiftly to restore trust by supporting reforms to prevent such abuses. These included statutes like FISA, the First Inspector General Act, expansion of FOIA, and the Whistleblower Protection Act. Levy knew that public trust ultimately depended on people believing that ours is a government of laws and not men, in which no person is above the law. That had special significance for the Department of Justice, whose work he saw imbued with a judicial nature. Its awesome powers demanded transparent and orderly decision-making processes subject to review at multiple levels and free from improper personal considerations or political interference. Levy emphasized the critical role of a dedicated professional staff who would bring zeal and determination and a great concern for fairness and impartiality. This vision has been an inspiration to generations of department lawyers. Bill Barr's service since last February has been a root and branch attack on Edward Levy's vision and reforms, indeed on the very idea that no person is above the law. Barr has sought to give the president nearly unlimited powers by negating or overriding many independent processes that operate as important checks on executive branch action. Here are some of the things that he has done. 
He has worked to defeat any meaningful oversight, either by Congress or by review in the courts, through litigation, legal opinions, and his own speeches. He has himself refused multiple times to show up in response to, appear, to requests to appear before Congress. He has worked to undermine Congress's appropriation power by litigating the President's right to divert funds to pay for his border wall, which Congress refused repeatedly to fund. He has regularly undermined the authority of independent decision-making processes and career professionals whose disinterested integrity Levy saw as a key element justifying public trust. He has done this by his own statements, such as last March when he publicly whitewashed the Mueller report's extensive findings on obstruction of justice, and last December when he publicly contradicted key conclusions reached by Inspector General Horowitz in his FBI election interference probe. Both times, Barr's intervention vocally reaffirmed positions advanced regularly in presidential tweets. He has also done it by enlisting various political cronies to review and reverse decisions of experienced career attorneys or by simply replacing them in handling matters of personal interest to the President. This is how he accomplished the reversals of long-held department positions in the cases of Trump associates Roger Stone and Michael Flynn, urging a much lighter sentence in one case and outright dismissal in the other. In a number of other matters, such as the intake of information from Rudy Giuliani and investigation of unmasking requests during the Obama administration, Barr has set aside certain subject matter to be handled by people in his, inner, in his political inner circle rather than by career officials who would deal with them in ordinary course. Finally, Barr has willingly supported removal of officials when their attention to duty proves politically inconvenient to the President. The treatment of U.S. Attorneys Jesse Liu here in the District of Columbia and of Jeffrey Berman in New York last Friday are two blatant examples. So is his standing by and voicing support as Trump during April and May of this year, has removed five inspectors general who have long served as, import, as an important check on executive branch corruption. In an ever greater, to an ever greater and quite shocking extent this spring, Barr has used the great powers of the Department of Justice to advance the President's narrow political interests and gravely undermine constitutional rights and the functioning of our democracy. Consider his apparent role in overseeing law enforcement action on June 1 to deny the right of peaceful protest in Lafayette Park, or the plainly frivolous motion filed last Friday to deny and denied one day later to enjoin publication of John Bolton's book for disclosing facts embarrassing to the President. Or worst of all, I think, are his flamboyant media discussions of the facts supposedly unearthed by the specially commissioned investigation he is personally conducting with the help of U.S. Attorney John Durham. Repeatedly, Barr has echoed the President's tweets and conclusively characterized the FBI investigation of Russian interference as an effort to spy on the Trump campaign and as, as he put it, one of the greatest travesties in American history. And he has hinted repeatedly that indictments are likely. This conduct is a textbook violation of Justice Manual Rule 1-7.400, which bars public comment on criminal investigations before charges are filed. Here, though, the wrong is much worse, as Barr is using a criminal investigation to produce fodder for the President's campaign propaganda mill, which can have its effect even though it is false. If this conduct in particular gives cause for great concern about what Barr may do next. Just one, one, another 30 seconds. In closing, it needs to be said that Bill Barr does regularly lie in ways that impact official action. Along with his continuing media project to make Americans believe that the FBI conspired against Donald Trump, his statements about the Mueller report, Jeffrey Berman's supposed resignation, and Barr's own role in the events in Lafayette Park come quickly to mind. So does his practice of regularly shrouding himself in the rhetoric and trappings of the rule of law, even as he desecrates and undermines the institutions that make it possible. But to me, Barr's crowning dishonesty Gentlemen's is the is portrait expired. of Edward Levy that a recent New York Times article showed hanging on the wall of his conference room as though the current incumbent regular, had regular anything. Order, regular order. The witness will conclude. Regular order is right. We're way beyond regular order. The witness will continue. Can I have one more sentence here? By all means. Okay. But to me, Barr's crowning dishonesty is the portrait of Edward Levy that a Mr. recent Chairman, I would ask Times that, the, uh, that the sergeant at arms witness be called upon to stop the disruption of this meeting.
I can't hear this witness. This is a very important witness. What yeah, well, he's way time? beyond and the chair time. has And if the there are no rules about when people can the talk, authority, there's no not? rules about when you can make noise. The gentleman makes a, a good chair. point, and the chair will enforce the five-minute rule. Witness will proceed. The chair will is not enforcing the five-minute rule. The witness will conclude. You, Mr. You chairman, this is outrageous. Conclude. Do you have no respect for the rules whatsoever? The witness will conclude. He's two minutes beyond concluding, and you don't let us have that kind of time. You gavel down immediately. You're being grossly unfair. This man the had a written statement, conclude. and he knew to cut it to five minutes. He couldn't do it. Either we have rules or we don't. The gentleman will suspend. The witness will conclude. Thank you. Well, then in we closing, can keep making noise. It needs noise. to be said that Bill Barr does regularly lie in ways that, that impact official actions. Mr. Chairman, there is not order in the room. There is a, a banging. No, there is certainly not. The Mr. Chairman, would you have Gene Krupa removed? The gentleman, the gentleman, the witness will conclude. That's what you said a while ago, and he didn't conclude. The gentleman will suspend. The witness will conclude. So the la I guess the last thing I want to sum up with, I've said all the rest of this, but the last point I'd like to make is that I think his crowning dishonesty in the face of what he is doing to the Justice Department is the picture that I saw in the New York Times a few weeks ago, a, a portrait of Edward Levy on the wall of his conference room as though the current incumbent has anything but disdain for the beliefs and achievements of his predecessor. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have a uh, parliamentary inquiry. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Is it not appropriate for the chair to exercise discretion in extending the five-minute rule as the chair sees fit? It certainly, <laughs> it certainly is appropriate. And is, uh, it a pr is it authorized under the rules of this committee? It certainly is authorized under the rules well, of this well, committee. Well, then uh, cannot the chair call in the sergeant at arms to maintain order when a member of this hmm? panel we'll, is we'll out of order? We'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll the move meeting. on to the next witness. Uh, Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Elias. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Elias. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Elias. Parliamentary point of order, Mr. Chairman. There is no point of order. How do you know? I've not said one. Here we go again. The, the gentleman is completely out of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman will state his point of order. Point of order is, is according to the House rules, it cannot, a House chairman cannot capriciously determine the five-minute rule at the whim of what he wants. It has to be fairly and imparticularly applied. That is the period of the House rules, and that is not what has happened. You, 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 you apply it fairly? About half of that. We are applying the five-minute rule as provided by the House rules. That's, the, so you're ruling on my point of order? The gentleman has not stated the point of order. I did state a point of order. I stated the not point agree. of order is the rules are being violated by a capricious chairman who is not following the rules of the House by arbitrarily deciding when the five-minute rule will be applied and when it will not be applied. You have not stated a cognizable point of order. The chairman has discretion. Mr. Chairman, you've not stated a recognizable way of running a committee in 18 months. So, I mean, let's determine it. The gentleman will suspend. The gentleman has not stated a cognizable point of order, Mr. Elias. Good I afternoon. did earlier, and you blow over it. The gentleman will suspend, Mr. Elias. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee. My name is John Elias, and I am a career attorney with the Department of Justice. I joined the department in 2006, and over the past 14 years, I have served under six attorneys general and three presidents. I have spent my entire legal career at the department. Although I am a current department attorney, my testimony is personal and does not represent the views of the department. Throughout my career in federal service, I have been taught to do the right thing for the right reasons in the right way. That is why, earlier this year, I asked the DOJ Inspector General to examine whether multiple antitrust investigations launched under Attorney General Barr were abuses of authority or other misconduct. The first matter that I referred to the IG concerned 10 investigations that the Antitrust Division launched into merger activity in the marijuana or cannabis industry. These mergers were not even close to meeting established criteria for these kinds of investigations. And yet, 
these cannabis investigations accounted for a full 29% of the division's full review investigations last fiscal year. For context, these kinds of investigations are rare. On average, only one to 2% of the thousands of transactions that come before the division each year get a full review. In the first of the cannabis investigations, the merger of MedMen and Pharmacan, career attorneys examined the proposed deal and determined that the transaction called for no further antitrust review. Staff reached this conclusion using the criteria under the horizontal merger guidelines that have guided the division for decades. However, on March 5, 2019, Attorney General Barr called the antitrust division leadership to his office and ordered the division to proceed with a full investigation. The division staff complied, issuing burdensome 15-page subpoenas that compelled production of 1.3 million documents from 40 personnel, all at great expense to the companies. Although the division ultimately found no evidence of antitrust problems, the companies abandoned the merger, citing delays in regulatory approval. The antitrust division went on to conduct similar investigations of nine other mergers in the cannabis industry. Division staff continued to document at the outset the lack of any bona fide antitrust issues. In some cases, the companies operated in completely different geographies and did not compete at all. Nonetheless, the division continued to issue subpoenas and compel productions of millions of documents from these businesses. At one point, the office handling agriculture became so overwhelmed with cannabis investigations that it had to pull in attorneys from the telecommunications, media, and technology offices. In response to staff concerns about these investigations, the head of the antitrust division, Assistant Attorney General Del Rahim, acknowledged at an all-staff meeting that the cannabis industry is, quote, unpopular on the fifth floor, unquote, referring to AG Barr's offices at DOJ headquarters. But personal dislike of an industry is not a valid basis upon which to ground an antitrust investigation. The next investigation that I reported to the IG concerns an arrangement announced in July 2019 between California and four automakers to limit fuel emissions. After news reports indicating that the president was enraged by the arrangement and wanted to retaliate, President Trump criticized the deal on Twitter. The day after the tweets, antitrust division political leadership instructed staff to initiate an investigation that very day. Ordinarily, decisions of import, here an investigation of a $630 billion automobile market, would take time and care to evaluate, especially when the action would face defenses. In the hurried investigation paperwork, staff acknowledged that it had only partially examined public information. Members of the committee, I have undertaken whistleblower activity and am here today because I recognize the imperative for law enforcers to operate even-handedly and in good faith. I reported these matters to the IG because they were evidence that our nation's antitrust laws were being misused. These laws have protected American markets and consumers for more than a century. The hundreds of career staff at the Antitrust Division take this mission seriously and expect DOJ's political leadership to as well. I thank you for examining these issues and will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Attorney General uh, Mukasey. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Nadler. Uh, ranking Member Jordan and members of this committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing. The topic of today's hearing, claims of politicization of the Justice Department, is serious and important because the fundamental duty of the Department is to pursue equal justice under the law, and we can and should expect no less. As you may know, I was privileged to lead the men and women of the Justice Department during the George W. Bush administration. Before that, I served as a, as a for, 19, for over 19 years as a district judge in the Southern District of New York, and that's the perspective that I bring to the testimony today. The Department needs capable, experienced, and even-handed leadership. Its components and programs have reach across the country and across the world. It handles matters as diverse as antitrust and anti-terrorism. It takes an experienced lawyer and leader to manage such a department effectively, and I believe without reservation that William Barr is that kind of a leader and that this country is fortunate that he leads one of the most important government departments. 
I do not have first-hand involvement in the particular matters to be discussed today. But based on my own experience, I can assure you that those are not issues of first impression for the Department or for the federal courts. The Justice Department is not politicized because senior officials disagreed with the sentencing recommendation from Mr. Stone. Trial lawyers in the Department are zealous advocates. That's their job. But zeal does not confer perfection or assure justice. My views on this case are no secret. I set them out on a piece written with Attorney General Meese in the Wall Street Journal, where we pointed out that the sentencing guidelines, which were adopted in 1987, initially as presumptively binding on the courts, have been strictly advisory since 2005 under Supreme Court law. Both as a judge and as Attorney General, I have declined to follow sentencing recommendations from trial lawyers. And as Attorney General, General Meese and I wrote, prosecutors are supposed to seek justice, not to play the sentencing guidelines like some sort of pinball machine to see how many times they can ring the bell, or to try to pressure a judge to impose a harsh sentence and also thereby cast doubt on the competence of the government by reading guidelines in a didactic and hyper-technical way without applying the one element that must be present when you read any law, whether statute or guidelines, and that is common sense. In a highly publicized and politically fraught case, it was not only proper but also advisable for the Attorney General to assure that the government's sentencing recommendations not promote that unworthy end. The decision to lower the recommendation was reached by others in the Department as well, including career lawyers, one of whom signed the, the, the lower recommendation. Attorney General Barr said publicly that he believed Mr. Stone's prosecution was warranted and, and that with his conviction that a jail sentence was warranted and that the jail sentence imposed by the judge was appropriate. I believe the trial judge agreed with the initial sentence, that the initial sentencing recommendation was overly harsh, as her sentence reflects. The Justice Department is not politicized because prosecutors dropped charges against General Flynn. In fact, as you heard this morning, the, the D.C. Circuit issued a writ of mandamus directing that that prosecution stop. As I understand it, the former FBI director talked publicly about having sent agents to interview General Flynn without following applicable protocols. And not using proper protocols wasn't simply a delicate problem of etiquette, like using the, the, the fish fork instead of the salad fork. It followed the deputy the director's uh, assurance to General Flynn that he need not have a lawyer present. And having agents base their investigation on a potential violation of a law, the Logan Act, that has never been prosecuted successfully since its adoption in the 18th century, is probably unconstitutional and that no rational person would apply to a potential national security advisor in any event. And this morning we saw documents showing that that theory was discussed on January 4, 2017, at a meeting in the Oval Office, which is to say the interview was a pretext for getting General Flynn, as one senior FBI official put it, to either lie or admit to something that could, not ha that could have him fired. The duty of the department is to do justice, and that does not end after a guilty plea, particularly when that plea is procured with a threat to prosecute the defendant's son that is concealed from the court and the probation department so that it would not have to be disclosed to future defendants against whom General Flynn might testify. That is a particularly gag-inducing feature of this episode to me as a former district judge, that that was being kept from the court. It is not unheard of for a prosecution to be dropped even after a guilty plea following the disclosure of new information that shows continued prosecution would be a miscarriage of justice. There seems to be a tendency these days um, to read ulterior motives into every action of Attorney General Barr. As Attorney General Meese and I noted in our article, it's helpful to consider a few data points from Attorney General Barr's tenure. First, despite his own skepticism about aspect of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's investigation, he allowed that investigation to run its course. Second, he supported the decision not to prosecute former Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe, a frequent critic of the President, despite evidence that not only did McCabe lie when he denied leaking information, but that he also berated others for the leaks so as to deflect suspicion from himself. He also Mr. Crossed. Chairman, uh, point of order. We are again being disturbed by tapping as the Chair exercises his discretion in letting the witness testify beyond the five-minute rule. And I'd like for that tapping to stop. And if it doesn't, I'd like for the 
You want somebody removed because oh, they, they want the rules in enforced? Main, main order. That's the amazing. The Mr. Gomer, you're not presiding over this the hearing. Mr. Nadler is. is. The, uh, members will show Some of us would like the, the rules enforced. The members will show courtesy to the witnesses, Mr. Gomer. Witness may proceed. Thank you. Um, so far as the claim that William Barr's service is somehow uh, a, uh, a desecration uh, of Edward Levy's service, um, I should point out that Edward Levy's portrait hangs where it hung when I was Attorney General, and that Edward Levy's grandson serves proudly as Attorney General Barr's Chief of Staff. So that attack is totally unjustified. Now, I've come to know Attorney General Barr over the years. I've had many discussions with him about the law and about public policy issues. And based on that, I have no doubt that the welfare of this country, upheld through the even-handed application of law so as to achieve justice, is what motivates him and motivates his decisions, and that's all that motivates his decisions. I think we're fortunate to have a person of his temperament, talents, and convictions in office during this difficult time in history, and I thank you very much, and thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, we'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. Before, before I recognize myself, oh, did we, didn't we? Oh, I, I am sorry. We have Mr. Zielinski on video, and I didn't know it's, uh, Mr. Zielinski will now testify. Good afternoon, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee. In response to your subpoena, I'm here today to testify about United States versus Roger Stone. I apologize for not appearing before you in person, and I thank the committee for allowing me to appear remotely today. For family reasons, I should not risk infection. As the chairman mentioned, I'm privileged to serve as an assistant United States attorney, a nonpartisan career prosecutor. Our job is to see that justice is done in every case, without fear or favor, without party or politics. It's unusual for a prosecutor like myself to testify about a criminal case. And as outlined further in my written remarks, there may be reasons why my testimony will therefore be limited in some respects. The Department of Justice has cleared me today to discuss matters related to the Roger Stone sentencing. Let me now turn to the Stone case. The first thing that every AUSA learns is that we treat every defendant equally and fairly. In the United States of America, we do not prosecute people based on politics, and we don't cut them a break based on politics either. But that wasn't what happened here. Roger Stone was treated differently because of politics. At the time of these events, February of 2020, I was a career assistant United States attorney, as I am proud to be now. I was not privy to discussions with political leadership at the Department of Justice. My understanding of what happened is based on two things what I saw and what I heard. What I saw was that Roger Stone was being treated differently from every other defendant. He received breaks that are, in my experience, unheard of, and all the more so for a defendant in his circumstances, a defendant who lied to Congress, who remained unrepentant, and who made threats against a judge and a witness in his case. And what I heard repeatedly was that this leniency was happening because of Stone's relationship to the president, that the acting U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia was receiving heavy pressure from the highest levels of the Department of Justice, and that his instructions to us were based on political considerations. And I was told that the acting U.S. attorney was giving Stone a break because he was afraid of the president of the United States. I believe that was wrong, and together with my fellow line prosecutors, I immediately and repeatedly said so. Unfortunately, our objections were not heeded. First, we were pressured to reduce the initial sentencing guidelines calculation for Mr. Stone without any clear legal rationale for doing so. When we refused to go along, we were instructed instead to disregard the guidelines entirely and to recommend an unspecified sentence, lower sentence for Mr. Stone. I was told that to the best of anyone's recollection, such a recommendation has never been made by the fraud and public corruption section of the United States Attorney's Office. When we again refused, we were told that we could be fired if we didn't go along. I notified the office that I intended to withdraw from the case rather than file a memo that was the result of wrongful political pressure. And while all this was happening, 
I was repeatedly told the department's actions were not based on the law or the facts, but rather on political considerations, Mr. Stone's political relationships, and that the acting U.S. attorney was afraid of the president. Shortly after I informed the office of my intent to withdraw, office leadership changed its position and allowed us to file a sentencing memorandum properly calculating the guidelines and seeking a guideline sentence. We filed the memo and heard nothing further that evening. But at 2.48 a.m. that morning, the president tweeted that the sentencing memo was horrible and very unfair and cannot allow this miscarriage of justice. Later that day, we learned the department was going to issue a new sentencing memorandum, mischaracterizing the application of the sentencing guidelines and asking for an open-ended downward departure for Mr. Stone. We were not allowed to see the new proposed memo. We weren't even told who was writing it. At this point, I made the difficult choice to resign from the case and my assignment in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. I resigned because following orders would have violated the oath I swore when I took my job. To be clear, my concern is not with the sentence Mr. Stone received. I'm not here to criticize the sentence or her reasoning. My concern is about process. The Department of Justice treated Roger Stone differently from everyone else, and I was told that the department cut Roger Stone a break because of his relationship to the president. I take no satisfaction in publicly criticizing the actions of the Department of Justice, where I have spent most of my legal career. I have always been, and I remain proud to be, an assistant United States attorney. It pains me to describe these events, but as Judge Jackson said in this case, truth still matters. And so I'm here today to tell you the truth. I would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you very much. We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. Before I recognize myself for questioning, without objection, correspondence between our witnesses, Mr. Elias and Mr. Zielinski, and the Department of Justice in advance of their testimony today will be entered into the record. These letters establish the parameters in which they are allowed to testify. I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Zielinski, you recommended a sentence of seven to nine years in prison for Roger Stone's felony crimes. Was your recommendation based on department guidelines? Yes, it was. And based on your 14 years at the department, did you believe that recommendation was warranted? Uh, I, I want to correct you, Chairman. I have been at the department for uh, just about, uh, it'll be six years this November. But based on my experience, I did believe that the recommendation was warranted, yes. But leadership at the department wanted a lower sentence. When you asked the department why they wanted a below guideline sentence for Mr. Stone, you were told it was, quote, political and because the U.S. attorney was afraid of the president. Is that correct? That's correct. What did you understand that to mean? I, I understood, as described in my written statement, to mean that political considerations were weighing in the U.S. Attorney's decision uh, and that the concern about uh, the President was driving his decision-making process. And what were you told could happen to you if you refused to go along with this lower recommendation? Uh, we were told that we could be fired. Now, you've described clearly that the Department treated Roger Stone differently than any other defendant because of his relationship to President Trump. Is this against department policy? It is. And is it wrong? It is. Is it unethical? It is. You wrote in your written testimony that it pains you to describe these events. Can you explain why it pains you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I took an oath when I took this job, as did uh, many, all, all of my colleagues who are assistant United States attorneys across the country. Uh, we are immensely proud of what we do. We are proud to serve in the Department of Justice, and we are proud that we prosecute without fear or favor. Uh, to describe a, an abdication of responsibility like this um, and this sort of contradiction of all the reasons that we have taken these jobs uh, is deeply uh, painful to me. Thank you. Mr. Elias. We just heard from Mr. Zelinsky how the department violated its own policies just to appease the president's whims. In your testimony, you describe a similar pattern. Am I correct that the department also pursued antitrust investigations against the advice of career attorneys to satisfy the political and personal whims of President Trump and senior leadership at DOJ? Uh, 
Yes, you are correct. And do you believe these investigations are in the best interest of the American people? I, I do not, no. And in your opinion, should the department have prioritized investigations that benefited the American people instead of pursuing the Attorney General and President's political vendettas? I, I think the department should be using its resources in a way that fulfills its mission, yes. Mr. Iyer, I'd like to turn to you. You have decades of experience in public service at the highest levels of the Department of, Justices, of Justice. These witnesses confirm that the Attorney General is weaponizing government resources, taxpayer dollars, to pursue investigations that do not in any way benefit Americans, but instead advance the President's personal and political agenda. Briefly, what is the impact on our justice system if Barr is allowed to get away with this? Well, let me, let me just correct one thing. I don't really have decades. I really had a little over one decade, but nonetheless, um, to answer your question, um, I, I think the problem is that there's a finite number of resources to be spent to advance a whole lot of uh, areas of our justice system. And so you're throwing money away. That's the first thing. But the more important thing is that by channeling enforcement efforts into inappropriate targets to, for the purpose, in some cases, of harassing people, which I think is often what we're dealing with, um, and also for ch channeling resources and spending time trying to give a special deal to other people, you're not only wasting money, but you're totally undermining public trust in the system. You're creating a, a situation I think we're on the way to something far worse than Watergate, where you had a problem of public distrust, because it's becoming very transparent that many things are being done, uh, essentially for reasons that are completely unrelated to the merits of the case. Mr. Zelinsky, you testified that you came forward because telling the truth still matters. I, too, believe the truth still matters. And we will not let this conduct stand, Attorney General Barr, will be held accountable. And I recognize the gentleman from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing is yet another attempt by the majority to smear this president and his administration. My Democratic colleagues were shocked and deeply offended that he won the presidency in the first place. They're still grieving that they failed to remove him from office through their phony impeachment debacle. And now they're targeting administration officials, in this case, Attorney General Barr, for merely acting within the scope of their duties. Where was the outrage when the Obama-Biden Justice Department investigated journalists, or when they retaliated against whistleblowers, or when they surveilled the Trump campaign? It's hypocrisy, and most people are going to see right through it. It just uh, shows that the majority will stop at nothing in attempting to distract and harass this president and his administration. Their efforts are particularly disturbing at a time when a global pandemic has ne negatively impacted us all and the country has been rocked by racial strife and civil unrest. There are other more important things we ought to be focusing our time and attention on rather than this distraction. Despite an exemplary record and career, Democrats are now going after Attorney General Barr. Why? Because he's cleaning up the mess of the previous administration and restoring integrity and honor to the DOJ and the FBI. Now, speaking about messes from the previous administration, Hillary's funding of the Steele dossier and the FISA scandal led to the Mueller investigation and the waste of a whole lot of our time and taxpayer dollars. Now, Mr. Zelinsky, uh, you were part of that Mueller team, uh, weren't you? I was. I was. And uh, that supposedly unbiased team of 17 attorneys consisted of 13 Democrats. Uh, that doesn't sound very unbiased to me, does it to you? Uh, I would uh, disagree with the premise of your question. Uh, we are, as I said, career professionals. Prosecutors do our job, uh, and we do it regardless of party or politics. But it was 13 it Democrats. It now. 13 Democrats out of 17. Uh, there's been public reporting to that effect. All right, thank you. Uh, former Attorney 
uh, former Deputy Attorney uh, General Rod Rosenstein, your boss, I believe, testified before the Senate recently that he wished Mueller had chosen a, quote, more politically diverse group. Uh, don't you think he has a point? Uh, I don't think it would be appropriate to choose any prosecutor based on their politics, and that is not what the special counsel did in that circumstance. In fact, if anything, if the special counsel had tried to weigh the politics of the prosecutors when he was choosing them, uh, that would have been more, far more deeply problematic uh, than what he did, which so is I guess hiring it was just professionals to do their job. Coincidental 13 out of 17. Something else I'd like to point out that I think clearly shows that there was indeed bias on the Mueller team was that as a group, they'd given $3,000 to Republican candidates in the past, but over $60,000, $62,000 to be exact, to Democrats, a 20 to 1 bias in one direction. Mr. Mukasey, uh, let me uh, turn to you if I can at this time. Do you believe that the Department of Justice under Attorney General uh, Barr has become politicized, as the, my colleagues on the other side are alleging? As I said, I do not. Would you agree that uh, Attorney General Barr has worked to root out politics, in fact, and bring transparency back to the department? I think he has bent every effort to try to run the department the way it should be run and to conduct investigations on the merits. Do you believe that Attorney General Barr makes decisions based upon political calculations or upon the relevant facts and law? I believe he makes decisions based on the relevant facts in the law and that if he made decisions based on political calculations, he would not have made the, the decisions that I alluded to in the last part of my remarks. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I'm almost out of time, so uh, let me conclude with this. Mr. Chairman, this hearing is uh, just another sad attempt uh, by you and the majority to attack this administration, specifically the Attorney General, unfairly, uh, and it's a shame. Uh, because there's so much other important work uh, that we should be engaged in in order to unite this nation, not to further tear us apart. Uh, and with that, uh, I yield back the balance of time. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from uh, California, Ms. Lofgren. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, given the appearance of political influence exhibited by this administration and the AG, and based on the testimonies presented to us, I'm concerned about uh, the integrity of our elections. In February, the Attorney General issued a memo outlining restrictions and policies for campaign-related investigations. I'd like to make a copy of that memo available in the record. Now, in part, the memo requires that no investigation may be opened or initiated of a declared candidate for president or vice president, uh, et cetera, absent written approval of the Attorney General. This is a departure from previous campaign investigation protocol. And having heard from witnesses today about the significant political influence affecting the Department of Justice, this at the very least raises the specter that decisions to investigate presidential campaigns could be politically motivated. Mr. Iyer, does the appearance of political influence over investigations into presidential campaigns raised by this memo concern you? It does, um, and it's one of a number of things that does. Obviously, the election is upcoming, and it's a huge, hugely important uh, phase of our national life. Um, and so the idea that we're not going to be handling possible investigations relating to the <laughs> election, uh, we're not going to be handling them in the ordinary course by even-handed professionals who are trained to do it, but we're going to have them handled in some special way, which I don't think we really know quite what it is. We know that it's a cadre of people that, right. that Mr. Barr has sort of set aside and said they'll handle this. This is only one of a number of areas where he has done this, and we know of some. I'm afraid there are others we don't, where, where right. whenever there's something sensitive, it essentially gets turned over to somebody that he can trust as opposed to someone who's a professional trained and, and even-handed in their handling of it. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, I, uh, I want to talk about uh, concerns that the <clears throat> Attorney General is abusing power in a way that is uh, quite real to Californians. As we know, the Supreme Court has held that due to their stake in protecting their quasi-sovereign interests, states have the authority 
to set regulations governing greenhouse gases. That's the Massachusetts versus EPA case from 2007. Now, California has applied for and received more than 100 clean air waivers over the past 50 years. None have been revoked. And as a result, the average uh, car sold nationwide is more than 99% cleaner than a car from the 1970s. Now, uh, as we know, uh, the Trump administration uh, has attempted to curtail Californians' action, and following that, <clears throat> uh, car makers and California worked together uh, to come up with uh, emissions that would work for California. Uh, this is important. This isn't just arcane stuff. I mean, in the Central Valley of California, we have the highest asthma rate among children in the United States, and a lot of that is because of emissions on I-5 and I-90 uh, Highway 99. So I, when I saw this, the antitrust uh, announcement, I thought he's just trying to uh, to scare these automakers to let them know that they're going to have to spend a lot of money if they deal with California as the law permits them to do. Mr. Elias, the investigation initiated. Was there any legitimate antitrust concern, uh, or was it simply because the, in, by the administration to to muscle the auto companies into not dealing with the state of California? So as I pointed out, the coincidence in time with the opening of the investigation was the day after the Trump tweets. Um, I think uh, staff had looked through some public resources, uh, public laws to see whether it might be um, permissible or not. And th that kind of thing we do all the time and don't proceed to a formal full investigation. So uh, to answer your question, no, I don't believe there was a, a proper basis to actually go forward with a formal investigation. Well, it looked to me that the department announced these investigations in really a bad faith uh, manner after the president publicly threatened these companies for disagreeing with his own policies. This matters. It matters not in an arcane way or in an academic way. It matters to the lungs of the children of the state of California. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a direct example of how misconduct and political corruption in the Department of Justice has a direct adverse impact on the people of, of America, and most specifically, uh, in this case, the people of uh, California. I just like uh, to note that I too was uh, around during the Watergate uh, matter, and uh, I uh, see some some parallels. But actually, this is worse, worse than Watergate worse than Nixon. I see my time is up, Mr. Chairman, so I yield back. The gentlelady yields back, uh, Mr. Gomert. This is incredible. Um, Mr. Ayer, you called Jeff Jensen a 20-year career prosecutor a political crony. Uh, by the way, you care to say into the microphone what you mouthed at me earlier when you'd gone over two minutes past your time? I didn't mouth anything at you, Congressman. <laughs> well, you just showed your lack of credibility, uh, both with Thornburg and people that have followed, has a real basis in fact. And in fact, um, rarely have we had anybody with the chip you have on your shoulder come before us. Thornburg said he believed that you were really never around. He said, uh, Bill Barr was the, and I'm quoting, the first deputy I had, and that came when I was two years into the job. Um, anyway, I, I understand you got fired by Thornburg. In fact, he said, Airproof, this is in his book, Airproof to have, have exaggerated notions of his responsibility to resent my confidence in Ross Runkle and Murray Dickman. Uh, soon developing a serious chip on his shoulder, he began taking actions independent of or in conflict with my wishes. Uh, once he sent a letter to Boyden Gray containing recommendations for corporate sentencing guidelines, I'd not even reviewed. Um, 
Ayer's resignation was announced on May 11th. Bill Barr checked. succeeded him and proved to be the deputy I had needed from the beginning. So I can understand why you'd be resentful 30 years later, but uh, at some point, uh, hopefully, Mr. Ayers will get over his chip. And uh, the fact that Mr. Zelensky, I was going to ask him questions, but um, and I understand family matters. And by the way, I'm grateful to my wife for sticking with me for 42 years today. Um, and there are family matters. Yeah, she's a lot more fair than than we're getting around here. But uh, so 42 years. Thank you, Kathy. Some of us have family matters, too, that are very pressing. But this is very pressing, too. Um, and I won't try to compare those. But Mr. Barr has come and testified, and he's coming again soon. So statements that he wouldn't come here, they're just not true. And you know what? I've not heard anybody, any of these three Democrat witnesses, express any concern for the Justice Department under President Obama going after local law enforcement. Why? Because in the opinion of the Justice Department, uh, they had violated people's civil rights. And A.G. Barr had that same concern that people's civil rights were being violated by governors or local authorities. And if he had no right to say anything, then the Justice Department under Obama had no right to pursue local law enforcement either. But I guess it just again, testifies to the credibility or the lack thereof of the people that have been brought before us. It is absolutely incredible that people could come in here and after the Justice Department, the FBI, including the FBI, Intel, top people, even DOD was paying Stephen Halper, all these people were involved in trying to prevent a Republican from becoming president and these three witnesses don't have any problem whatsoever with that. History will not judge you kindly in the days ahead. Whether we get to continue this little experiment in self-government or not, because you have been an accomplice after the fact to what has occurred in the Justice Department, and you are so biased you cannot even see it. So I don't have a lot of questions for people who don't have credibility, have chips on their shoulders. Mr. Elias, for heaven's sake, you come in here with your complaints. It's, it's, it's just, it's a shame we don't have a serious hearing. It's just a sideshow, and it ought to be called for what it is, and that's why I am. And if we're concerned about justice, we need to get after the people that created the injustice through the last administration, and I yield back. And Hank, I don't have any problem with you doing that. If I see my the thoughts. gentleman yields back. The uh, the gentlelady from uh, uh, Texas. Mr. Chairman, I know that we are not here to discuss personal matters of the witnesses. Let me acknowledge, uh, uh, General, uh, for your presence here today, McKay. We have certainly worked together in the past. Let me acknowledge uh, our three witnesses, of whom each and every one of you are patriots, and I thank you for your service. I'm reminded of the time of the Department of Justice when uh, those of us in the South, during the midst of the Civil Rights Movement, looked to the DOJ for the relief of then the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. Honest, straightforward, and dealing with not the crisis, but the bloodshed of the South in the midst of fighting for freedom. They were a hand that we held on to. I am disappointed that we now face the circumstances of a drunken party gone wild. Sadly, the Department of Justice has gone wild. So I think it is important that we highlight and begin to move on correcting the wildness, the out of controlness and begin to focus on standing up a Justice Department
that works for the American people. We heard today from all of you about the effects of the President's politicization of his Justice Department for his own ends. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle would like to suggest that this is not true. They want to cover their ears to this injustice. So I'd ask them what Jonathan Kravis, a career prosecutor with a decade of experience, similar to some of you here today, asked in his recent op-ed, quote, if the department truly acted because of good faith, commitments to legal positions, then where is the evidence of those commitments in other cases that do not involve friends of the president? Where are the narcotics cases in which the department has filed a sentencing memorandum overruling career prosecutors? Where are the other U.S. attorneys who wouldn't go quietly into the night? And as Mr. Kravis wrote, there are none. All of the cases are political cases, friends of the president. Is that because the only case in the United States that warranted intervention by department leadership happened to involve friends of the president, or of course not? Is that because attorney generals regularly lie to the American people about U.S. attorney resigning, when in reality he is being pushed out for prosecuting the president's inner circle? Of course not. Remember the U.S. the Attorney General Barr? It was the president that fired him. Remember the president saying, I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know anything about it. What the Department of Justice is doing is an unprecedented erosion of our constitutional system. It has gone wild. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been refused uh, to acknowledge the truth for a while. When asked about Lafayette Square, they said they didn't see it firsthand. It is never acceptable to turn a blind eye to injustice, and thousands of former officials are now coming out to speak truth to power. There are literally thousands of individuals across Republican Democratic administration. Over 2,000 who worked in the Department of Justice signed a letter. So it is a grave threat to fair administration in this nation. We are all equal before the law. A person should not be given special treatment in a criminal prosecution. Thousands of department officials wrote again after the Flynn prosecution expressing the same sentiment. And yesterday, members of George Washington Law School faculty did the same. Over 1,000 former DOJ talked about the rule of law. I believe it is a clear and present danger, and we and he must be held accountable, the Attorney General, who, yes, has been invited to this committee, but has refused over and over again. Mr. Iyer, you have served in multiple administrations in both parties. Are these thousands of people right? Is Barr's current and present danger uh, to our constitutional order of, of the rule of law, constitutional order, rule of law, and even uh, an even-handed administration of justice? Is Attorney General Barr a current and present danger? Mr. I Ayers. Yes, Congressman Jackson Lee, I, I think he is, and that, that was the theme of what I tried to say before. And I think essentially it's for two reasons. One is that he has a personal belief uh, that the president should be above the law, and he has uh, worked very hard to achieve that by negating the checks and balances in a variety of ways, uh, by making the president not accountable, stonewalling uh, the Congress, stonewalling um, the uh, Southern District of New York, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the District Attorney's Office trying to do a criminal investigation, so preventing information from, from coming out and otherwise essentially putting the president beyond the law. The second thing he's doing, and this has accelerated this spring, um, is getting involved in a very political way, uh, essentially in using the Justice Department to support the president's campaign. Um, and comments he's made about opening up the country, um, uh, the, the activities in Lafayette Square. The most serious problem here that I'm concerned about is his accelerating recitation of this narrative about, I don't know what you call it, Obamagate or uh, deep state conspiracy or whatever it is. The thing that we were hearing from uh, um, ranking member Jordan earlier, um, he is using the fact that he has his own investigation going on as a basis for supposed facts uh, to assert that these things are true. Number one, I don't believe they're true, but more importantly, that is a totally improper misuse of the Department of Justice. Even if those facts were true, 
it would be a violation of the Justice Department rules to be reporting to the public on things that he's supposedly finding in that investigation. And if you look at my written submitted testimony, you will see just a very concise chronicle of the number of times he has gone on television uh, to make, and on the radio, to make these assertions in detail um, about uh, these things that are going on. In fact, what, one of the ones that I had to chuckle about was on Sunday um, with uh, Maria Bartiroma. Uh, he's, he actually said that he was surprised hmm? that uh, the public doesn't seem to be paying attention to the things that he's been saying about these outrageous things that have been uncovered. He doesn't understand why people aren't paying enough attention to his reports on the Durham investigation. Well, that is gross violation of the Justice Department's policies, even if the facts were true, which I frankly think they clearly are not. So we have a real problem here, and the drumbeat of his misbehavior is accelerating as we get closer to the election. I don't know what's next, but I'm scared to think about what it might be. The time of the gentlelady Chairman. has expired. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to submit into the record DOJ alum statement on Roger Stone, DOJ alum statement uh, regarding the sentencing of, uh, uh, of Roger Stone and statement on uh, Mr. Flynn, uh, and uh, DOJ alum statement to Michael Horowitz, the Inspector General. I ask unanimous consent to place these uh, in the record at this time. Without objection. As I uh, notified members during the markup on June 17th, I view the wearing of face masks as a safety issue and therefore as an important matter of order and decorum. Because I am responsible for preserving order and decorum in this committee, I am requiring members and staff attending this hearing to wear face masks. I came to this decision after the Office of the Attending Physician released new guidance requiring masks in committee hearings. The Chair's authority to enforce the preservation of order and decorum during committee proceedings derives from the Speaker's enforcement authority under Clause 2 of Rule 1 of the House. The Chair would greatly prefer that all present simply uphold the decorum of the committee by complying with these reasonable safety standards. Failing that, any member who fails to uh, wear masks will not be recognized. I now recognize the uh, uh, general, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And I do uh, would like to make a couple of statements. Number one, there may be discretion for the chair in opening statements, and you may enjoy hearing Mr. Ayers talk, but under Rule 11, you do not have discretion under the five-minute questioning rule to continue that. It is interesting, though, the way we've talked about political consideration of uh, prosecutors today. In fact, I have a really big problem going on right now in Fulton County, Georgia, where a prosecutor, it appears, has put political motivations in a re-election bid uh, at the heart of going after the Atlanta Police Department. And just as was said earlier by my gentlelady from Texas, it's never acceptable to turn a blind eye to unfairness, and this needs to stop. Mr. Howard does need to remove himself, and the investigation, which has never been done and finished, needs to continue so that the right can be done for all parties, as we have been speaking about prosecutorial the gentleman ethics yield. today. No, I will not. You're considering, Mr. Elias, you consider yourself to be non-political career staff. That was your statement, correct? When I go into the Justice Department every day, as a career employee, I leave my politics at home, yes. Okay, and that was the same as Mr. Zelensky, Strzok, Mr. Strzok, Ms. Page, others have done that. Let me ask you a question. As a career staff uh, being non-political, did you ever attempt to get detail to this committee's majority staff? Um, I, like yes or no. people over time, have explored various career options. Did you, within the last, under this majority, ask to be detailed to this majority staff? Um, I had a very preliminary conversation with... Uh, you, so you did have a conversation. Yep. Was it to work on antitrust policy? Uh, it was, yes. Okay, and as we have all sworn under oath here, in fact, th did you not ask to be detailed to the committee's work on oversight during impeachment? Is that not correct? Refresh your memory. I, I may have also asked for oversight at one point with, with the blessing of assistant attorney. Okay, so you asked to come to this committee. As a career, as a career staffer, non-political career staffer, you were asking to be detailed to this committee to work on impeachment. You wanted to come work for the majority during the impeachment of Donald Trump. Is that not correct? If not, if, yeah, I understand how that answer would be troubling. So if you want to just no, stop right there, I, you've answered. I actually think that... I think it was a year prior. I, I honestly think it was. Uh, but the detail to this majority, we were the majority beforehand. This was to the majority. It, it was uh, early 2019. Uh, okay, so. that's the majority of this staff here, and we were starting every investigation known to man at that point. 
In fact, they hired very good attorneys out in New York to become friends with them. But you asked to come to this committee. I, so, I, Alain, a little bit of the career staff, let's just leave it there. Let's go to your actual testimony today. Okay. In your written testimony, you contended that mergers with cannabis industries were, quote, unlikely to raise significant competitive concerns. You further stated that few documents, uh, a few of the documents produced in response to the subpoenas were ever reviewed by antitrust division staff. You essentially said that the second request were made for purposes of burden these companies. So you filed, as you cited earlier, a DOJ uh, about complaint about this with the Inspector General. Is that correct? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And the Inspector General handed the complaint over to the Office of Professional Responsibility for the investigation, correct? No. Uh, the, Excuse me? The Office of Special Counsel handed it to the Office of Professional Responsibility. So, but it was handed over and yes. investigated. Is that not correct? That's correct. Okay. So, as you're, you're reading, and that is fine, you can give your half of the story, continuing on, the letter of the Office of Professional Responsibility, uh, the Office of Professional Responsibility indicated that they conducted a thorough review of your claims and concluded they were without merit. Is that not true? So they concluded that even if the investigations were motivated by animosity, that that would still comply with the DOJ. So my answer to my question is yes. In fact, what did the letter say? It said, from the OPR, it reviewed the submissions from the Whistleblowers Council and HER, conducted its own review of the relevant laws, regulations, rules, policies, guidelines governing the issuance of second request, and reviewed publicly available information concerning the cannabis industry. OPR's review found support for the ATR's response. The cannabis industry provided a unique challenge to the federal and state regulators alike, and it was reasonable for ATR to seek additional information from the industry through its second request process. In addition, contrary to the whistleblower's allegations, the documents provided by ATR reflect significant and successful negotiations among ATR and the cannabis companies concerning the narrowing of the scope of the second request. Furthermore, the internal memorandum recommending the closure of the investigations reflect that ATR staff conducted a significant amount of analysis regarding the competitive impact of the proposed mergers and often explained how the actions of state regulators offset competitive concerns, basically undercutting the very discussion that you had in your opening statement. The concern even goes on further, and this is an interesting one. You wrote in your written testimony that you were, the cannabis injury you restructured the staff, quote, were not instructed to conduct interviews of customers and that marijuana is not a Schedule One drug, correct? Is it a Schedule One or not? Uh, I'm not That's sure exactly which one. schedule it's on, but it's on one of them, yes. Or you I, were part I, of an antitrust in marijuana and didn't know how it was scheduled? And then we've asked to be part of this committee. Mr. Lash, you're, 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 the, the credibility of this is going downhill quickly here. So, Mr. So Chairman, it, I mean, this, this, at this point in time, I'm entering into the record the letter from the Office of Press Responsibility basically clearing anything that was done in DOJ I ask that it be committed into the record. Without objection. Without objection. I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could respond. The gentleman, the gentleman yields back. I want to note that uh, Mr. Elias's political inclinations and job prospects obviously have absolutely no bearing on whether the serious allegations that he is making about the Attorney General are true. That is the subject of this hearing, and anything else is merely a personal attack and a, dis and a distraction from the corruption he has uncovered at the department. It goes directly it to intent of the witness. why some members may want to change the subject, but I hope we will focus on the issue at hand. Mr. Cohen the is intent. recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's interesting how all these things kind of come together. Today, a three-judge federal panel, District Court of Appeals here, said that the Flynn case could be dismissed. And the person that wrote that opinion was Judge Rayo. Judge Rayo had been at OIRA, the agency that reviews regulations and does what Trump likes best, which is jeopardize the safe air and water of the American public and give in to industry and profits and pollution. And she did a good job of it. And the case she was most well known for was overriding President Obama's regulations on automobile exhaust. She became a judge a year ago. She said today, the district court's actions will result in specific harms to the exercise of the executive branch's exclusive prosecutorial power. If evidence comes to light calling into question the integrity or purpose of an underlying criminal investigation, the executive branch must have the authority to decide that further prosecution is not in the interest of justice. Well, I wonder, Judge Rayo, if who is supposed to look in to the executive branch when what they do is not in the interest of justice? Well, it should have been Judge Rayo. It was one of the three judges, and maybe the full panel will re review it. They should. Uh, the other way to do it is impeachment. 
in, impeachment is the process by which if the Justice Department and the executive branch are not pursuing the interest of justice is the process left. And even if the ultimate trier of the Senate is impotent to see the truth and to exercise discretion in keeping with the American public and with the rule of law, we should pursue impeachment of Bill Barr because he is reigning terror on the rule of law. And it's questionable what he's doing. Uh, Mr. McCasey, you said that there was an 1807 law, the Logan Act, and you disparaged it because it was an old law. Is that correct, that it was, was the one that was used to prosecute? I did not disparage it because it was an old law. There are many old laws that are very fine. Our Constitution is even older. You said that. that it was 1807, hardly ever used, and made you, you disparaged it in the terminology that I you didn't used. use the specific law, 1807. What I said was it has never been prosecuted successfully. It was prosecuted twice in the, in the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, both unsuccessfully, and that it is probably unconstitutional. Well, thank you, sir. I'd, 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 I'd just note that Bill Barr used an 1807 law, the Insurrection Act, to interfere with First Amendment rights so that the President could wa march through Lafayette Park and do his photo op holding a Bible in front of a church, not quote from the Bible, not lead people in prayer, but have a photo op in front of a church, a desecration of the Bible and a desecration of that church. So that was an 1807 law. Mr. Elias, you've testified as to cases that Justice and Antitrust took up concerning areas that otherwise you didn't think or the Justice Department superiors didn't think were worthy of antitrust investigations. One was cannabis. Uh, That's correct. Did, was that cost the cannabis folks a lot of money? Absolutely. These subpoenas that get issued that require production of millions of documents is very burdensome. To so it was money. harassment by Bill Barr of an industry he didn't like. Is that right? Uh, I, I think that's a fair way to characterize it, yes. And ironically, that, just like Judge Rayo, it all comes back to one place. Barr doesn't like marijuana. Marijuana is seven times more likely to be enforced against young African Americans breeding discontent with police and breeding interactions with police, and Barr doesn't care about that type of stuff because he doesn't like marijuana, so that's okay. That's one of the breeding grounds of distrust of African Americans and police and police and African American contact and problems. Gre very unfortunate. And you also brought up the antitrust case, which brings us back here with Judge Rayo on the antitrust with the automobile manufacturers. Did Mercedes-Benz not join in on that case later? Uh, that's correct. And why do you think Mercedes-Benz didn't join in on that case? So uh, I have read news reports that the German government discouraged it from joining because of the DOJ investigation. I don't have firsthand knowledge of those events. So the likelihood is President Trump, who didn't like what Governor Newsom did, got his way and kept Mercedes-Benz out of it and was able to try to change them from taking their position to be similar. Uh, let me ask, Mr. McCasey, let me ask you this. Mr. Zelensky testified that for the guidelines where the defendant went to trial and remained unrepentant, in his experience, it was unheard of, especially like in Stone's case, when in the lead up to the trial, we was told no, no time, no one in the fraud and public corruption section of the United States Attorney's Office in D.C., which prosecuted that case, no time could he ever recall or anyone recall where the government did not seek guideline sentencing after trial. Do you know of any cases where the fraud and, and public integrity section did not seek guideline representation? I do not, nor do I know of any Thank case. Thank you, sir. You nor don't, do I know because of there is case. not a case. There isn't a case, but Bill Barr did it because Trump's friend... Point of order. The witness was trying to answer the question. A, that was Point not a order. guideline recommendation. It was a travesty of a guideline recommendation. I have the time, and I don't know who over there is playing... Play, I have the time, and this is a travesty of order, because this is another case fire. where politics is overcoming the rule of law and destroying America. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Jordan. Questions for Mr. Zelensky, if he can hear us on video. Mr. Zelensky, where are you physically located today? I'm at my attorney's office. What state is that, sir? It's in the District of Columbia. So how far are you approximately from where we sit right now? Uh, I guess about a half mile. Hmm. And what's your reason for not appearing here today, sir? Well, thank you for allowing me to clarify. Uh, as a prosecutor, particularly with the experiences that I've had in Baltimore, I'm, I'm reticent to discuss my family publicly. Uh, as we're You have family concerns, is that right? It. Is that right? That's what you touched about uh, earlier. I, I, I have a newborn child, Congressman. Okay. Um, is a physician.
we discussed the matter. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm Fair not enough. Sure listen, I just wanted to listen. Right my now. time. Hold on. Mr. Zelensky, because you're an attorney, you know, you know that, that having uh, a witness appear and submit to cross-examination in person is obviously much more effective and reliable than one who simply phones it in, and we'll leave it at that. I just want to point out, the Honorable Judge McCasey showed up, flew from New York. He has family concerns as well. Many people do here as well. In fact, he's got to quarantine himself after this hearing because he has a young grandchild who's sick with other... The uh, gentleman, the gentleman, the gentleman, the gentleman, the gentleman is uh, improper. The witness is complying with the rules of the House. We make no distinction between people who are present physically and people who are present by video. Mr. Chairman, uh, it's my period. time, and it is not inappropriate, and you don't get to decide how I ask my question. Oh, questions. yes, I do. With all due respect. You said in your opening, Mr. Zelensky, that we don't prosecute people based on politics. The question is, do you investigate people based on politics? No. Um, a couple of questions for you. Uh, related to um, Inspector General Horowitz's report outlining the FBI's improper FISA surveillance of Car Carter Page. You're familiar with that, correct? Uh, I have read press reports regarding it. I have read some of the report. Uh, I have not studied it carefully. Do, do you know what role Christopher Steele played in the FBI's investigation of Carter Page? I only know what's been publicly reported and what is in the Inspector General's report, Congressman. If you're familiar with the report, then you must know that it states at page 359, quote, we concluded that Crossfire Hurricane Team's receipt of Steele's election reporting on September 19, 2016, played a central and essential role in the decision by the FBI OGC to support the request for FISA surveillance targeting Carter Page, as well as the department's ultimate decision to seek the FISA order. Does that sound familiar? Uh, I have no reason to doubt that you're accurately reading from the report. What, what discussions did the special counsel team have about Christopher Steele? Uh, Congressman, I have been uh, asked by the department because of privilege not to discuss matters uh, related to the special counsel's office. I am happy to go back to the department, as I have uh, been told that I should do, to ask them if I can answer your question and to, uh, if I am able to, provide you an answer at a later time. But I've been in told by the department that my testimony today has been cleared only for matters related to United States versus Roger Stone. That, that's that's uh, pretty convenient. Uh, the, the subpoena that you were issued says you are hereby commanded to be and appear before the Committee on the Judiciary to testify to hearing touching matters of inquiry committed to said committee or subcommittee, and you are not to depart without leave of said committee or subcommittee. The, 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 the point is, Mr. Zelensky, it would be very useful to have you here. It'd be very useful to have you speak into the full scope of the concerns of this committee and things that we've been working on for a long time. And we think it's very unfortunate um, that you, you could not um, uh, make your appearance here today, especially since you're a half mile away and others took great risks to be here. I, I look, not, not quibbling with you about family concerns, but a lot of people have them. And this is a very important matter for the country. I think we all agree to that. We have concern that this is being politicized and that the current Attorney General's office is being accused of politicizing something when what he is trying to do is clear up and clean up messes that were made by his predecessors in previous administration. Everybody can look at the facts, I guess, and draw their own conclusions, but it would be helpful if would we were able to draw yield? them out. I, w I won't the gentleman yield. gentleman yield? I will not yield, because what our problem with this is not only with the process, as has been stated, with the unequal administration of the rules here, but with the way that this committee's time is being used right now, with all the important issues that are within our scope of jurisdiction, with all the pressing matters facing the country right now, this is a farce. And we're, um, we're really sorry that you couldn't be here Mr. for it in Johnson, person. Will you yield? I'll yield. I, I would just urge you to consider, when you say with all the pressing issues, mm -hmm. is there any issue more pressing than the integrity of the administration. Yeah, absolutely. Of but, I mean, is there my anything time. more? Reclaiming my time. Making? We would love to have hearings about the origins of the Russia collusion thing that you guys wasted the country's time on for five or six months uh, on the, the sham impeachment. But don't get me started because I'm out of time. I yield back. Ask John Bolton about the sham impeachment. Not your time. Not your time. Ten, gentleman's John time. Bolton. The gentleman's time is ex has expired, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Zelensky, and Mr. Elias. You put duty over country, um, and you have come to testify today, putting your job at risk. And, um, and I think the nation owes you both a uh, debt of gratitude <coughs> for coming forward as whistleblowers. 
Now, Mr. Elias, uh, last summer the state of California announced that it had reached an agreement with four automakers on air quality standards that would be stricter than the rules the Trump administration was preparing to adopt for the country, correct? Yes, that's correct. And when California announced that agreement, President Trump made clear that he did not like it, didn't he? Uh, he did criticize the agreement on Twitter, yes. And on August 20th, 2019, the New York Times reported that he was, quote, enraged by California's deal, end quote. Trump even apparently called the White House meeting to plot ways to retaliate, all because he resented the fact that California and the four automakers would dare to undermine his loosening of air quality emission standards. So the next day, August 21st, Trump went public and he threatened the four automakers saying that these countries, these companies, quote, will be out of business, end quote, if they don't get in line. Then the day after those tweets, August 22nd, President Trump's Justice Department followed through on that threat that's when Attorney General, Assistant Attorney General Dal Rahim gave an instruction to your division to start an antitrust investigation immediately into those four automakers. Is that correct? It, that is when the instruction to open the investigation happened on August 22nd, yes. And so the President tweets out threats and then the next day, the automakers get hit with an antitrust investigation. That's what happened, didn't it? And, and a point I would like to underscore is it, normally uh, for significant complicated matters, uh, people put time and attention into assessing potential defenses. But you didn't have any time to do that because the president made the order on August 22nd, on August 21st, and the investigation began on August 22nd. Uh, there, there was very little time between those two events, <laughs> yes. Do you believe that the department commenced that investigation based on good faith belief that they had committed a violation of the antitrust laws or not? So the, the career staff who examined it saw some very obvious defenses, things called state action, nor Pennington, uh, and uh, you, you really have to twist things to get around those, so uh, it, it did not appear to be in good faith, no. That investigation didn't have anything to do with protecting the American people from anti-competitive behavior, did it? So the, um, the career staff who reviewed it had uh, some great concerns about opening it, especially the people who were then charged with actually conducting the investigation. Uh, they wrote they documented their concerns with the legal underpinning of the, of the case. And uh, if you're immune from eventual prosecution for something because you have a legal defense, you should be immune from investigation for having And the law was well. clear that the state of California was immune. Um, so the, the, what I describe in my complaint is how uh, staff was not given enough time to go through and, and properly and, and, understand that. And I that wish this. I could give you a chance to explain more. But um, bottom line, it wasn't a le le legitimate antitrust investigation, was it? That's what my complaint alleges, yes. And, and if it had been, the first step would have been for the department to get with California officials and get the facts from those officials, but it never did even establish contact with California, did it, before it instituted the investigation. That step is permitted even before an investigation. You could have resolved things even before opening the investigation, but it's correct. Yeah, to my knowledge, they, they were never contacted. So what we have here is a clear-cut case of the antitrust division being made to respond to a president's tweet the day before to begin an investigation that had no basis in law or in fact. Uh, Would you describe that as an abuse of authority of the upper echelons of the Justice Department? Uh, well, I, I did submit my complaint to the IG on the grounds that it, the events here constituted an abuse of authority. All right. With that, I will yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Um, uh, Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zelensky, it seems to me you got just one problem. The judge disagreed with you. 
Uh, Congressman, uh, I, as I said, I'm not here to critique the judge's sentence. Uh, we well, you write, to a, you write Mr. Zlinski, policy. you write a 13-page statement for your for your statement to this committee. You allege all kinds of politics. You go after the Justice Department, you go after Bill Barr, you go after the President. You file a sentencing memo on February 10th, recommending seven to nine years. The very next day, your boss files a supplemental sentencing me uh, memo recommending three to four years. And nine days later, Judge Berman Jackson picks the three to four year sentence. So the judge Congressman, disagreed with uh, it. Congressman, I, I don't agree with the premise of your question on two levels. The first is the well. Tell me what in that. Tell me what in that fact pattern. Tell me what in that fact pattern is wrong. Didn't Roger Stone get 40 months? The supplemental memo, Congressman, did not uh, recommend three to four years. It recommended a sentence of incarceration. Uh, the supplemental memo also mischaracterized other aspects of the guidelines. Mr. And Zlinsky, it Mr. Zlinsky, the I've looked the at the supplement. I've looked at the supplemental memo, and it said 37 to 47 months. What was the? Take away the enhancement. It said 37 to 47 months. Those were the numbers referred in the memo, and Judge Berman Jackson picked 40 months. She didn't pick seven to nine years. Is that right? Uh, she uh, sentenced Mr. Stone to 40 months. That's correct. And that's between three and four years. Exactly what uh, was in the supplemental memo. Did you talk to Bill Barr about your concerns? No, as I stated, I did not talk to the Attorney General. You didn't talk to the Attorney General? Did you talk to the DAG, the top the Deputy Attorney General? Thank you. I was not provided the opportunity. Did you talk to, your, did you talk to Mr. Shea? Did you talk to the U.S. Attorney? I requested to, but was not given a meeting. So you didn't talk to any of the people who ultimately make these decisions, did you, Mr. Zelensky? I requested to speak with the U.S. Attorney, uh, but I, I didn't was not ask you if you requested. I said, did you talk to him? You didn't talk to the Attorney General, didn't talk to the DAG, didn't talk to the U.S. Attorney. Who's the supervisor? Uh, the, uh, which supervisor are you referring to? I'm talking about the one you referenced about six times in your testimony, page two. It was told to me at the time of. Uh, by my supervisor in the U.S. Attorney's Office. You said, I was told that the acting U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia, Timothy Shea, was receiving heavy pressure from the highest levels of the Department of Justice. Page 10 of your testimony, you say this, page 10, I was explicitly told that the motivation for changing the sentencing memo was political and because the U.S. Attorney was, quote, afraid of the President. Who told you? Thank you for clarifying, Congressman. I just want to be sure that I get the right supervisor because there are a couple of supervisors. Well, tell me all their names then. That told me things. So the supervisor for the questions you're asking is the supervisor of the fraud and public corruption section at the time in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Who? Uh, his name is J.P. Cooney. All right. Who else? Uh, at the time in the office, uh, there was a first assistant, there was a criminal chief. Uh, they were all involved in these discussions, to my knowledge. Did any of them talk to the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, or Mr. Shea? Uh, yes. Who? My understanding is they did. Well, it, it, did it? Uh, not understanding. Did understanding, they or didn't they? Uh, Congressman, I can only tell you what I know. I can tell you from what I well, understand. It, it sounds like you don't know man. much. It sounds like you heard stuff that you're now bringing to this committee as fact. So-and-so says to someone what they told someone else, and you bring that here as fact. Uh, Yet you didn't talk to the Congress, Attorney General, you didn't talk to the Deputy Attorney General, and didn't talk to the U.S. Attorney who made the decision. And oh, by the way, the judge sided with, with their supplemental memo, not the memo you signed. Congressman, as I said, I don't agree with the premises of your question, and I'm happy to explain further involving sentencing. Uh, my understanding is that all of the people I mentioned, those supervisors, were all in meetings with uh, acting U.S. Attorney Shea. Well, I mean, I just this 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 is as bad as this is as bad as the whole impeachment. The 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 anonymous whistleblower who uh, had no firsthand knowledge was biased against the president and who worked for Joe Biden. Now we have a a, a so-called whistleblower with no firsthand knowledge who didn't talk to any of the people who make the decision and who is obviously biased against the attorney general. Uh, it seems just as bad, just as lame as as what we went through just uh, just a few months a uh, few months back. Um, it seems to me, as others have pointed out, and I know my time is winding down, that, that the real politics here was in some of the investigations that took place prior. And when, when we have some time, I'd like to get into that as well, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Mr. Deutsch. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zielinski, I I'd like to follow up on Mr. Jordan's questions and ask about the severity of Roger Stone's crimes. He was convicted on one count of witness tampering and six counts of obstructing a congressional investigation by making numerous false statements. Isn't that right? He was actually convicted on the one count of obstructing a congressional investigation, five counts aligned to Congress, and one count of tampering with a witness, Congressman. But what, and what did he lie about? Uh, he lied, as I go over my written remarks, about a number of things, including uh, what he was doing in the summer of 2016 related to WikiLeaks and what he was telling the Trump campaign about it. Yeah, he lied about providing information stolen by foreign government to Trump's campaign. Isn't that right? Uh, he lied about uh, providing information to Trump's campaign regarding the WikiLeaks material. Yeah. That's correct. Right. And, and were these minor misstatements, uh, or did they impact the congressional investigation? Uh, the, the, both the judge found at sentencing and the, argued that they profoundly impacted the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence's investigation. And the judge found that, too. That's, uh, that's helpful. Roger Stone communicated with WikiLeaks and then lied when he said he didn't tell the Trump campaign staff, even Donald Trump himself. Isn't that right? Uh, Mr. Stone lied about what he told the Trump campaign yeah. regarding WikiLeaks. That's correct. Right. And and what did Roger Stone do that threatened a witness, Mr. Uh He did a number of things. Uh, he had told the witness to prepare to die. He had threatened the witness's dog. He had threatened to harm the career of one of the witness's friends. He had written a slew of nasty messages to the witness. And I know it's... I, I know that, that we've been talking about these issues for a while. It's worth pointing out, he, he told the witness to prepare to die. Did it appear that the threats worked? Mr. Zelensky, did they impact the witness's testimony? They did. And Mr. Zelensky, would you say that these are serious offenses? Yes. And, and help us understand, how did you come up with a seven to nine year recommendation? Did you follow the guidelines? Was it was it at the top or bottom of the range? And, and what were the enhancements that increased the sentencing range? So uh, in coming to the sentencing recommendation we did, uh, we do what we do in every case. Uh, we consult the PSLR, which is a report that's prepared by the court. Um, we consult the relevant Department of Justice policies, and then we look at the guidelines sentences. It's important to understand that the guidelines in this case were clear and the applications were readily apparent. Uh, it was not a tough calculation. After looking at that, we looked at what other sentences had been, and we determined what a reasonable sentence would be in this case. Normally, the department defends recommendations within the guidelines range, don't they? Uh, it is the policy of the department and reiterated the memo in 2017 to set yeah. guidelines recommendations in and, general. And in, but in your written testimony, you stated the team was pressured to submit inaccurate guidelines, uh, an inaccurate guidelines calculation that would result in a lower sentencing range. What was the nature of that pressure, Mr. Zlonski? Uh, so there were meetings uh, the members of my team had with leadership of the U.S. Attorney's Office and the acting U.S. Attorney, where he sought to get us not to ask for the guidelines that clearly applied. And so you, after the pressure, you submitted your sentencing memo. Then the department leadership submitted a new sentencing memo for a lighter sentence. That's very much outside the normal practice in your experience, isn't it? I think uh, outside of the past, not an accurate description, uh, unprecedented and virtually unheard of is what I would call it. After your sentencing recommendation was overruled, you and your entire team withdrew from the case. Why'd you do that? Uh, because we took an oath uh, to prosecute without fear or favor, and we weren't going to violate our oath. Uh, Mr. Zelensky, it was political pressure that got Roger Stone a lighter sentence than he deserved. Mr. Stone got special treatment because of his connections to the president. That's not justice. The rule of law is supposed to mean equality under the law. Now, this case is a glaring example of Bill Barr corrupting DOJ, undermining equality in our legal system. And that's what's one of the reasons that we're here today. On Monday, you did your job and filed your recommendations to hold Roger Stone accountable. In the middle of that very night, the president tweeted, and Bill Barr's DOJ snapped into action the next day to take pressure off. That, that, Mr. Zelensky, is not justice. And I yield back.
The gentleman yields back, Mr. Johnson. Mr. McClintock. Mr. Big. Am I recognized there, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman, am I recognized? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, I do find it, the setting for this to be um, deliciously ironic on the day that the uh, d uh, circuit court um, dismissed the Flynn uh, prosecution. Because, because you see, um, the Flynn case typifies the previous administration's abuse of the process for political reasons. I mean, you have a you have a political appointee who is attacked, leveraged, and they went after him for political purposes, used and abused the power and authority that they have. In fact, they knew it was bogus all along. I mean, uh, even, even Peter Strzok's notes indicate pretty clearly that Director Comey acknowledged that General Flynn's phone calls with Ambassador Kisley appear legit, and those were the basis for trying to invoke even the Logan Act. I mean, that's, that's really kind of the way it is. But uh, I, I thank uh, Judge Mukasey for being here today. Uh, Judge Mukasey, uh, the, the chairman indicated in his opening that he, he views uh, Attorney General Barr as a fixer for, pres for President Trump. And yet, uh, what we have here is uh, President, or excuse me, Attorney General Barr saying that President Trump has never asked me to do anything in a criminal case and wishes that he would stop tweeting because it makes it impossible for me to do my job. Does that sound like a guy who's a fixer? Sorry, not to me, sir. Well, how about this? If you heard, if you heard somebody say this, um, that I'm still the president's wingman, so I'm there with my boy. Does that sound maybe like more some, uh, if that's coming from an attorney general, does that sound like somebody who may be more of a fixer? I don't know about fixer, but if I had ever said anything like that when I was attorney general, I would have expected to return to the department and find the building empty with a pile of resignations on my desk. So th that statement was made by former attorney general Holder. Um, and so my, my question is, uh, we know that under attorney general Holder, DOJ went after multitudes of investigative journalists. Uh, Judge McCasey, have you heard or do you have any information whether under William Barr, for whatever reason, that he's gone after uh, investigative journalists? I do not. Then we, we know that uh, under that, that department, that Justice Department, they prosecuted whistleblowers. I know President Trump is, has ex expressed exasperation and disapprobation of certain whistleblowers and wished that they were prosecuted. Do you know of any prosecutions administered by this administration under uh, William Barr of whistleblowers? I don't. I don't. Um, we could go over a whole plethora of these types of things. Civil Rights Division, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, uh, they dismissed voter intimidation lawsuits. I guess my question for you is, do you know of any dismissal of voter intimidation lawsuits on the part of William Barr? No, although I, I have to say I've not made a particular study of that, of that area. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. I don't know of any. Uh, the Fast and Furious issue. In that particular uh, situation, Attorney General Holder would not come in for over a year to testify. Attorney General Barr has been in to testify. He has indicated a willingness to come back in and testify. The whole plethora of, of abuses by the previous administration's politicized Attorney General's office leads me to ask this question of my colleagues. And I, and I think it's been typified of what we've seen here today. We've, we've gone through here, there's, there's been uh, ru running over of the minority by the rules. It's really problematic. It really is problematic. If you want to know why this, this body, this group, this committee gets out of hand from time to time, people talking across each other, I'm going to tell you what it is. 
It's when you don't invoke and follow the rules, you become a little bit chippy. And that's what we have in this committee. And it's because we don't have the rules fairly and evenly followed. And that's the crying shame of this, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just start by saying that uh, part of our colleagues said that, you know, the whole hearing is here so that we could embarrass the president. Let's just be clear. If we wanted to embarrass the president, we would sit back and do nothing and just let him continue to embarrass himself and say that you should drink bleach or disinfectant to cure COVID-19, that he slowed down testing, that it will magically go away, or the absurd statement that he has done more for black people than Abraham Lincoln. So uh, in law, we just say rest is for local, which means the thing speaks for itself. So instead of trying to embarrass the president, we would just let him continue to do it himself. What we're here today to talk about is the abuse of power and miscarriage of justice. So, Mr. Zelensky, let me just go to you. And I, I think that I want to follow up on what Mr. Deutsch was talking about, and that is to really understand why Roger Stone got such special treatment, but make sure we focus on the context of his crime. So what his crime was, was lying to Congress about his dealings with the Trump campaign, one of the convictions, right? That was one of his crimes, yes. And the summer before the elections, Stone told the Trump campaign that he had, quote, a plan to save Trump's butt, and he, and he knew how, but to win, but it wouldn't be pretty. Do you recall that? Yes, Congressman. I think you've replaced the profanity with another one, but that is correct. Uh, then also, uh, Mr. Zelensky, Mr. what was Mr. Stone's plan? Uh, testimony at trial uh, indicated that this was related to WikiLeaks. And did you find evidence that Stone communicated with senior levels uh, of the Trump campaign about WikiLeaks releasing stolen information about Trump's opponent? Yes. In fact, there are dozens of calls between Stone and the Trump campaign's top officials, right? That's correct. Also during that time, did you find evidence that Stone was talking to Trump directly? Yes. In fact, uh, witnesses also testified that they were present when Stone spoke to then-candidate Trump, right? Uh, Mr. Gates testified to that at trial, Mr. Cohen testified to that for Congress, and Mr. Manafort told that to the special counsel's office. Did you all find any records of these calls? Um, as I discussed earlier, it's difficult to know because we can't get content. We can only see call detail records, when calls happened. There certainly are calls within that time period, but it's impossible to know the content. Only the people on the calls or anyone that overheard them would know the answer to that. And why that's so startling is because President Trump's written answers to the special counsel, he denied recalling having any conversations with Stone at all that summer. And he denied being aware Stone was having any conversations with WikiLeaks or anyone else in his campaign. Do you remember that? You've accurately described the president's answers. Yes, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Zelensky, have Roger Stone and Donald Trump been friends for over 30 years? The evidence introduced at trial showed that to be the case. And Ms. Stone, and I believe the president has acknowledged that as well publicly. So you found evidence from multiple sources that Roger Stone regularly communicated with the Trump campaign about the stolen information. You also found evidence from multiple sources that Roger Stone talked to President Trump, his friend of 30 years, uh, directly during this time. And you have phone records corroborating all of this, but yet the president doesn't remember speaking uh, to Roger Stone. And then when you recommend seven to nine years for Stone's crimes, all of a sudden your department gets pressure from the top to give Stone an unprecedentedly favorable treatment. Is that a correct characterization? 
Congressman, I want to be very careful on how you describe the phone records that would give corroboration. We have call detail records. Uh, they don't give the full universe of possible calls because they only we only have them for the number that we have. So if, for example, a conversation took place on a line that we had not subpoenaed or uh, someone else's phone, we wouldn't have them. And as I said before, we do not know the content of the calls. We know only what people testified. So I, I want to be very careful as to uh, what that's, we say about call detail records. That's fair. Uh, but let me tell you, as a former defense attorney and lawyer, it's clear to me what happened here. Roger Stone got special treatment. Uh, because he was covering up the president's misconduct, and the attorney general made it possible. The double standard here is absolutely sinful. If you're the president's longtime pal, if you're covering up his wrongdoing, you get special favors. But if you're peacefully protesting brutality, you get tear gas. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The committee will stand in recess for five minutes. And we've been watching the House Judiciary Committee hold a hearing on alleged political interference at the Justice Department. Let's bring in Keir Dougal now. He is a former federal prosecutor and current CBSN legal contributor. Hi, Keir. Great to see you and great to have you with us today. Before I get your take on the hearing, though, I want to ask you first about the breaking news involving Michael Flynn. A federal appeals court has ordered all charges against the former national security advisor to be dropped. You'll recall he pleaded guilty to making false claims to the FBI. So, Keir, how exactly did the court come to this decision? The court um, relied on a presumption um, that the Justice Department's motion to dismiss was regular. Um, and granted the, this presumption of regularity to the uh, motion that would dismiss the charges, um, that's the principal basis or one of the principal bases upon which the court decided that a hearing should not be held and that this panel, it's just a panel of the appellate court, not the entire court itself, ruled that the hearing should not go forward and that Mr. Flynn's uh, criminal case should be dismissed. So is Flynn now entirely off the hook, or could he still face some legal challenges going forward? Well, if um, this panel decision, in which there was a dissent, there were three judges, two ruled to, dis to dismiss the case and, and short-circuit the hearing based on a, a presumption of regularity, as we just discussed, um, if they have the last word, then yes, it's over. But... Um, uh, the, there may be a so-called on-bank review where all of the judges at the appeals court can step in and, um, and, and uh, basically make a, another ruling. So, no, Mr. Flynn is not completely out of the woods yet. All right. So, switching gears now to today's hearing on Capitol Hill, is there anything you heard from Aaron Zelinsky that stood out to you as a former federal prosecutor? Yeah, um, uh, we heard the testimony uh, that he gave about the completely irregular process. Um, he, he said it was unprecedented, unheard of, that, um, th that in the sentencing proceedings for Mr. Stone, where um, the senior leadership at the Justice Department overruled the prosecutors who had tried the case to um, mischaracterize the, the, the so-called guidelines, which are sort of the base set of rules for sentencing of all defendants, to try to place the, the case on an even playing field with every other defendant, uh, so that the judge can then make decisions about what the appropriate sentence is. Um, that uh, Mr. Zelensky's testimony is really quite um, shocking. Uh, about the procedure that occurred that led to that overriding men, uh, uh, filing. Uh, the other thing I think that was really surprising is that Judge Mukasey, um, someone who uh, is widely respected, spent 19 years on the bench, also testified today that he had never uh, seen a case where a procedure like this had been used. So uh, Mr. Zelensky's uh, testimony about how really unheard of it is 
to have the senior leadership overrule under these circumstances the, the line prosecutor's recommendation, um, that was uh, really stunning. So aside from this being unusual, I want to get to whether it's illegal, if true, because we did hear Zelensky say he believes that Roger Stone was treated differently because of his relationship with President Trump. So if that is true, is that not illegal, Kier? So it is, uh, as Mr. Zelensky testified, it's unethical and it's wrong. And so, uh, you know, if there's an effort to obstruct the proceeding here, um, if there is a, if there is, a, it's pot it could potentially be illegal if there is a, an effort to obstruct the, the proceeding. Um, but I, I think that the larger issue to focus on here, Tanya, is just how uh, that it's wrong, that it flies in the face of our rule, our, our understandings of the, that we're, as a country, we're ruled by laws, not the whims of individual people or presidents, that, that the law is supposed to pl apply even handedly. And what's truly shocking is the testimony that uh, Trump, uh, that Stone got preferential treatment because he is a, a pal of President Trump. So, Kira, a spokeswoman from the DOJ said Attorney General Barr did not discuss Stone's sentencing with President Trump or anyone else at the White House, for that matter. In fact, she also claims many of Zelensky's allegations are based on hearsay and not firsthand knowledge of conversations. How might that factor into all of this? So, um... Look, I would be surprised if um, the attorney general wasn't aware of the public statements that um, President Trump made and uh, had been making about uh, Mr. Stone. So uh, it doesn't necessarily require a direct conversation between Mr. Barr and President Trump for Mr. Barr to become aware of what President Trump's wishes are. Um, that doesn't seem terribly uh, of, of much moment to me. Now, Mr. Zelensky is doing what every careful lawyer does. He's not testifying about things that he doesn't know about. He's testifying about the things that he does know about. And we can we can look at the two at the two filings. We can look at the filing that was initially um, uh, given to the court, um, and then we can look at the one that was submitted later by the uh, senior leadership of the Justice Department. Um, and you can you can look at the differences uh, between the two filings and understand what happened. So, what, what could be the ultimate result of all of this? Let's say everyone hears this testimony and decides yes, this was unethical. But now what? So, um, look, I, I think what we're seeing in the Judiciary Committee is an effort to. Uh, inform the public about concerns about politicization of the Justice Department. Um, so there are potentially political consequences. Um, the uh, Justice Department itself has some internal procedures. Uh, if there are irregularities or wrongdoing, um, it's possible that uh, the Justice Department itself may look at these things. There's an inspector general. There's an office of professional responsibility. So there are internal checks at the Justice Department that may come into play here. But, Keir, what happens if those internal checks are in a Justice Department where the head of the Justice Department is also, some would say, acting questionably? Right. So, Tanya, you're getting to effectively a conflict of interest concern that, you know, the, the watchers of the watchers are being controlled by the people who are the subject of the uh, in, in investigation. I mean, it, we've long known, right, this is not a new idea, that if you control an investigation, if you can select the evidence um, of the person or the things that are being investigated, you're not going to find very much. And so there is a, a, a concern, uh, one that's that I think the House Judiciary Committee is trying to highlight here uh, about politicization and lack of independence at the Justice Department, which creates the possibility that we don't get the full facts. 
Well, Keir Dougal, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your legal expertise on these thorny issues with us. Thank you so much for that. We're going to take a quick break now, but we'll be right back. So stay with us. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. Sinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. Joining us now is the nation's top doctor, Surgeon General Jerome Adams. How soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? Making sense of our world. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. On the day of his death at the hands of four former Minneapolis police officers, a grocery store worker accused George Floyd of using a counterfeit $20 bill. Some, particularly in the Muslim American community, are questioning why the store called the police in the first place.